When our best fur friends leave our world, many of us are left wanting one last scritch, one last hug, one last walk together. One Last Network is a space for pet guardians to honor their pets in their senior years and to cope with the days leading up to and after their passing. Here's your host, Angela Schneider, founder of One Last Network and Big White Dog Photography in Spokane, Washington. Colleen Ellis understands and appreciates the depth of love pet guardians have for their companion animals. She's felt it many times over. Her dogs, her fur kids, are her world, and as each one leaves her physical world, she finds ways, thoughtful, impactful ways, to honor the lives they lived here on Earth with her. Colleen started the nation's first standalone pet funeral home, Pet Angel Memorial Center, which now has locations across the Midwest, Southeast, and Carolinas. Colleen also recently released her first book, Pet Parents, A Journey Through Unconditional Love and Grief. She also operates Two Hearts Pet Loss Center, an online resource for pet professionals to learn more about the grief journey pet parents endure. I am a certified pet loss grief companion under Two Hearts Pet Loss Center. She is a student herself of Dr. Alan Wolfelt, who teaches that people in grief need a companion, someone to listen and be present, rather than treatment, because we are not broken. We simply need others to witness our pain and loss and support us on our new paths. Colleen is an incredibly engaging, dynamic interview, and I am so proud to have my teacher, my mentor, and my friend on the podcast today to talk about the ways we can keep our best fur friends alive in our hearts and in our stories. And with that, we talk about how to make those final days with your pet peaceful, empowering, and memorable. Have a listen. It is a long one, but Colleen gives us so much great information and advice. Good morning, Colleen. How are you today? (gasps) I better now. I'm so good. I, I freaking wait. love your energy. Oh my gosh. Right back at you. We're, wow. we're probably going to have to set a timer here because I have a feeling we could go on for days. I, I think that this could be like hours if we let it. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I, know. I know. Your journey in pet loss grief starts in 2003 when your girl Miko came down with cancer. Can you share a little about that story? Yeah. You know, I want to back up a tiny bit from there. And um, my, my journey in death care, let's start there. That was actually my career right out of college. You know, it's one of these things that who to thunk in college, you're like, oh man, I'm going to get into death care when I graduate. That's how we're going to rock this world. Mm. But I did. And man, I got to tell you, I find it so rewarding to be able to help people with this one part of when in life. And so let's go with her. She, she was my girl. I didn't, I I didn't have skin kids. I didn't have skin kids. So I had fur kids and I had fur kid and she was my fur kid. And so she got everything that an only child should have. I mean, she had a nanny. She traveled everywhere with me. She had own clothes. She had everything. She was rotten. And I, and I love your photography because finally one year, my mother said to me, She said, Colleen, I know you get her picture taken every year. And she said, "Um, but we're probably not changing much, are we? And I'm like, oh, contraire, I can see a change every year. Girl, I forgot to tell you the story. Can I tell you a story real quick about photography? Absolutely. I'm here for it. There was a, a photography studio and she was she was probably just a couple years old. And I thought I am going to go get her professional portraits taken. Right. So I call this photography studio and I make a, I make an appointment. To, now this would have been in 1991. Oh boy. Okay, I just, I just dated everything here. <laughs> 1991. Cause she was only two years old. 
Hey, that was even still film camera. So it was, it was funny because when I went to, to view, I took a girlfriend of mine to view the pictures and literally they set us in this, in this room, probably 10 by 10. And it was like a really small theater and they pulled back curtains and started playing, you know, some sort of your only in picture. I, I don't even know what it was, but my girlfriend is like, is this happening? Is this happening right now? I'm like, yes, it is. You better settle in. We had our popcorn and we were watching her show. So anyway, I call this photography studio and I said, I want to bring my daughter in uh, for pictures. And um, yep. So I show up with her and I'm checking in and they keep looking around me like, uh, did you bring your daughter? And I go, mm -hmm, I did. And like, um, still can't see her. And she's all of nine pounds. She's a little tiny thing. Aww. So I, I kind of force her over the desk. I go right here. And they looked at me and they go, we don't do dog photography. And I said, you know what? I said, I just read your contract and it doesn't say that in your contract. So today we're going to take pictures, aren't we? And we marched to the back of that studio and girl, I got to tell you something. The photographer comes out and he's like, I'm not used to this. And I said, I'll help you. I'll help you. I know, I know what she responds to. I know what words you can say. So we're going to get the perfect shot. I know all this kind of stuff. And so he is now having a blast. I'm saying the word treat. I'm saying, go for a ride in the car. I'm saying all the stuff, you know, that we know ears are going to go up and all that. My most priceless picture though, was he was changing the film in his camera. Gosh, we're dating ourselves. Aren't so we? badly. <laughs> so badly. He was changing the film and she laid her head. He had her on a chair and she laid her head down and she cocked her head and she didn't take her eye off of him. Like, I don't know what you're doing. And, and it was the most priceless reflective photo. Mm. And I am telling you about two months later, I drove by that photography studio, which sat on a prominent road. And there she was bigger than life in <sighs> the window with a sign that said, we now do dog photography. Oh my gosh. You changed you, somebody's world. I do love that, honey. Wow. That's I great. forgot to tell you that story. I love it. So, okay. So that kind of tells you what she meant to me. That oh kind of tells you. So now we're approaching the day and I was in the funeral industry and um, man, I tell you what, when the day came, it uh, it rocked my world. And I'm probably like a lot of your listeners here. I didn't know what my options were. I mean, I knew what my options were when people died, right? Yeah. And I'll never forget the veterinarian coming in and and saying to my husband what our what our option was at that point at that clinic, which was a really, really, really unacceptable option. Mm. And I said, no, not happening here. Not with my baby girl. And I said, we're going to load her up and she'll come home with us. And like I said, she's all in nine pounds. I scooped her up, took her home. We found a human funeral home that finally helped me. And, uh, but prior to that, we kept her home for a couple of days. I had to arrange everything. I had to arrange my own little funeral. I had to arrange my own little memorialization pieces. I had to do everything. Nobody was there to help me. In, in fact, when I went to the funeral home and, and mentioned that I wanted an urn, they said, you know, people just don't do that. People don't do that. And I said, well, I'm, I apparently am not them <laughs> yes. because I will, I will. And I did a bunch for her because it's, it's what I wanted to do for her. Okay. Mm -hmm. And as, as she was dying, Angela, I, I started looking around and I said, where, where are the operations that handle people and pets? Like I know we handle people and people where, where is that? And I didn't find what I believed it should look like. Mm -hmm. And so I created it. And she she is the legacy for me behind the push and the and the why fire, the why fire in my belly that every day I get up and I say, why do I do what I do when it comes to end of life care for pets? And it comes back to Miko. And she is my why fire. And she drives me every day that every Miko out there and, and Bella's and all the, all of them. They all deserve to have dignity and respect in the end of life walk. And you know who else deserves that, Angela? You and I, yeah. you and I, because our heart has just been ripped out of our body. Oh. And, and I, I want, I want something that gives both of those the dignity and the respect and the support and the space and everything it deserves to honor this precious little creature who was put here for one reason to love me. Mm -hmm. That's it. 
When you talk about dignity and death, and you having been in the industry for so long, have we gotten better when it comes to pets and end of life care? I mean, I know that there are support and services out there now. Um, I don't know that the average pet guardian is knowledgeable enough about them. And that's why that's one of the reasons I'm doing what I'm doing. So is, is it, has it, has it gotten better in your eyes? You know, when it's gotten better is when a pet parent has been empowered to ask for what they need. Mm. And that's when it's gotten better. And, but now let's be real. We don't wake up. I've said, if I've said, if I've said this once, I've said it a million times. We don't wake up on a bright sunshiny morning and say, today, I'm going to go figure out what my death care options are going to be for my precious beloved Bella. We don't do that. Right. Okay. We, we say one day, one day I'll figure it out. We say, if it happens, right. Mm -hmm. If it happens, no, it, it's a win. It's going to be a win. And, and then we get in this position that we're making knee jerk reactions because it's now and we didn't stop and think. And, and I, and I tell people, here's how it gets better. It is going to happen. Okay. When you're there, let's, let's talk about it in a few different aspects. When you're there, what I want you to do is I want you to project yourself out six months from now. And I want you to look back on this end of life walk. And I want you to ask yourself, what will I do right now to make the end perfect? When I look back on this day, six months from now, I, I don't want to say, dang, I wish I would have, or boy, he would have really loved. I want you to do that. If, if he got such great joy out of barking at the UPS guy, load him in that wagon and go chase that UPS guy. If he loved McDonald's nuggets, I want you to go get him 19 times today. I want you to do everything. Oh man, I got to tell you a story. I had this, I had this girl, we were at, um, we were at, I was at a veterinary conference and, and here she comes down the exhibit, down the exhibit hall and she's, and she's waving her hands because she's clean, clean. And I get to her and, and I'm thinking, man, I wish I could, I wish I could remember when I, you know, when I saw you and, and she said last year when, when we were together and my, I must've sat next to her at something, she said, I shared with you that it, it was time for my girl. It was time. And she said, you told me about this six month, you know, think about it six months. And she goes, I did. And that's exactly what I did. And now she's sobbing. And she says, cool, the end was perfect. The end was absolutely perfect. Now we got these talking, right? Yep. She, she has an opinion. And this one's going to answer it. <laughs> so um, she says, I got to tell you what I did. She said the, the weekend before we put her to peace. She said, I, I went and I painted her portrait. And she said, then the next few days we did bucket list. Stuff. And she said, then we, then we, uh, Wednesday was the day. And she said, so I went out in the, in the driveway and I painted a rainbow with sidewalk chalk. And she said, I invited all my friends and family over to say their goodbyes. And when the time came, we went out in the rainbow, put her to peace, walked across proverbial rainbow bridge. And she came in and she lied her baby in state under the portrait and for the next two days had a visitation where she backed up and said hello as she prepared to say goodbye. Do you love it? I do. And, and it's so, when you think back on that and as a family to say, you know, when it comes to end of life, we move from cure to care. Mm -hmm. And I know there's nothing more that can be done. I know what's going to happen. I'm going to take this event, either of death or euthanasia, both. I'm going to take this event and I'm going to make it an experience. And during the time that maybe the veterinarian's there, she's going to be eating chocolate. She's going to be, she's going to be having ice cream. She's going to have a little slice of heaven right here on earth. And I want you to, we have to plan those things. Mm -hmm. We plan those things so that the so the end can be perfect and we can look back and say yeah you know what I don't like that it happens either but there's nothing we can do about it it's going to happen what I want you to do is to look back on it and say it was exactly as it should have been she went out exactly like she lived like we lived 
when you think about end of life care for humans, we often plan our own end. We have a will. We disperse the things that we have in the ways that we want to. We can pick our own casket. We can ask for whomever to do the eulogy. We can write our own eulogy if we want. We plan it out. Is it because pet end of life pet care is still such a stigmatized area? Is it is it a, a shameful piece or a, a an embarrassing piece to put yourself out there and say? I'm doing this for my dog. When, when at the core of it, all you're really saying is I love my dog that damn much. You know what? Let's unpack that a second. Mm. 70% of our population has a pet. Mm -hmm. Okay. One more stat. Well, actually a couple more stats. 83% of the 70% refer to themselves as mommy and daddy. So (laughs) you and I, we look at our pets as, as family members, right? Totally. Pet loss is still referred to as a very disenfranchised grief. Mm -hmm. Here's what's interesting. The rules for pet loss, the rules for pet grief, the rules for pet mourning, the rules for pet rituals are written by the 30% who don't get it. Oh, right. (laughs) So the 30% turn to us and say, Angela, you are extreme. I mean, it's just a dog. You should probably get over that. Yeah, and you're gonna have a funeral. I mean, that's just that's just downright out there. Mm-hmm. You, you just need to choop, bring that in a little bit. And so, in st- in our very vulnerable state of of this grief and this loss, and the fear of being shamed, we choose to do nothing mm. because, I, first of all, I, I'm I'm struggling, I'm hurting, and so to have the strength to do something. I don't have that strength. Okay. I, I, I'm fearful of who I ask to help me for them, for fear of them shaming me and saying, you don't need that. You just need to suck it up and get back to work tomorrow and it's all going to go away. Okay. And so instead of doing any of that, we do nothing. This is the six month goal that I keep talking about. I want, I want to give you permission. I want to give you permission to do whatever you want to do. And I, and I find it interesting when people come in and they say to me, I want to have a a service for my animal. I say, great. And and when they say that a lot of the times they whisper it to me (laughs) and I say, I think that's awesome. And they're like, but don't you think people think I'm crazy? I said, what do we care about what people think? What do we care? What do we care? Let me tell you something in my kitchen right over there. Meal time in our house is a very happy time mm. for our animals. Okay. I have every food bowl from every animal living and deceased that lines my kitchen. Oh, that's my way to pay tribute to them for a very special time in our house. And people kind of look at me and they're like, what do other people think? And I said, what do I care? And if they don't like it, they can leave my house. Yeah. It's my mortgage. It's my house. And if you don't like all the food bowls lining up there, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I don't care. I, I got to tell you, I did a, a funeral service for a little kitty cat. I'll never, I'll never forget this. His name was Vincent, a little orange tabby cat. He was so beautiful. His mommy, Vicky, beautiful relationship, beautiful funeral service, memorial service. Memorial service means nobody present. Sure. So we had Vincent's urn there. Okay. After the service was over, this gentleman came up to me and he had a little tear in his eye. And he says, and I always hate this because I'm like, man, I am about to hear something I'm not going to unhear ever. When he says to me, can I, I have a confession. I'm like, oh, seriously, here we go right now. Here we go. Here we go. And he goes, I have a confession to make. I said, okay, what? And he goes, I only came here to the funeral today because I love Vicky. He goes, but I came here to the funeral today because I've never been to a funeral for a cat. And I just wanted to see what it was like. I said, oh, I said, so what'd you think? And he started crying crying. and he goes, all I can tell you is I hope my funeral service is as beautiful as this one was. Oh, the love that, oh, just, yeah. And you know that the love we have for our animals, I mean, it's just, it just radiates the room. It just radiates the room. How can you not love that? 
how do we move more towards a place of acceptance for people like us? Or do we bother caring? Do we just take care of each other? Well, we take care of each other and we help each other. We help each other get through it. We don't get over it. We don't get over it. It becomes a part of us. And, you know, I got to tell you, it it wasn't that long ago. My husband and I were out. Miko's been gone almost 20 years, almost 20 years. And we were out to dinner and I just, I had a grief burst, Angela. Had a grief burst right there in the restaurant, in the fondue restaurant, (laughs) in the fondue restaurant. I felt so sorry for the waiters. He was like, can I, (gasps) Never mind. He got all freed because I'm having a grief burst moment, right? Woman being emotional, red alert, woman being emotional. Oh yeah, totally. And my husband was like, we're just talking about a little doggy we missed. So we're good. Just give us a minute, you know? And, and we had a little moment there for Miko and um, it's okay. It doesn't mean you're crazy. It doesn't mean you're stuck. It doesn't mean any of that. What I, what I want people to do is I want them to, to first of all, be kind to themselves. Okay. And that's my first rule. I want you to be kind to yourself. I want you to treat yourself like your own best friend who's hurting because of a loss they've had. That's what you are. Be your own best friend. Wherever you are right now is exactly where you should be. And number three, honor the journey, honor the life you shared, honor this chapter of your life. Who, who This chapter right here has the name Bella on it. Mm-hmm. Nobody else will have that chapter. It's got that's Bella awesome. on it. And it's a chapter in your life story. And so I want us to give ourselves permission to make space. Let me tell you, here's what I tell people. When, when that, when, when grief, when she knocks, I want you to open the door and let her in. And I want you to bring up a chair and I want you to say, I want you to sit down. Cause I want to tell you all about Miko. Cause that girl rocked my world. She rocked my world. And I want you to know about her. I want the world to know about her. And I want you to listen to me. I don't, I don't shut the door. I don't lock it. You know, I always describe it. I know, I know our listeners can't see this. I got a soda bottle here that I've been sipping on grief for me. And and I tell people like this, I describe it like this. I said, pretend as if in my, in my grief, I'm shaking up this soda bottle. Okay. Because that's how we feel. We're shaking up, right? Mm -hmm. I'm shaking up this soda bottle and I keep this lid tight. I keep it tight. And then one day, Something happens that reminds me of her. And all of a sudden this lid just comes off and you know what will happen with a shaken up soda bottle? It explodes, right? That's what we do. Versus with grief, little bits of letting out that, of letting out that, that emotion Mm -hmm. and a little bit everyday morning work. Every day we do a little bit to open that lid and to release that pressure, which doesn't mean we're over it. It doesn't mean we're never going to cry again. Yeah. It just means we've ta- we've reconciled and said, you know what? It, it, she she has been a part of my life. She is now a part of my story, forever a part of my story. And I remember her not in a in in the physical way because she's not here anymore. I remember her in my memories. I remember her through this chapter that she had in my life. I remember her through the lessons that she taught me. That now every day I do that thing just for her because she taught me that lesson and that is how the chapters get to bleed together and move together to create my life story what an incredible segue to start talking about storytelling um i have a friend who um she's she's uh, she'll be doing she's doing some of our, our podcasting with me um her name is darlene and she just lost her 14 year old husky last month And, um, it's still, she's still very much in the acute stages of grief and, uh, um, you know, she's not ashamed and I, and I love her for that. Um, and she'll break down with me and I will, I will let her sit in that grief. And then I will just ask her a simple little question. Tell me about Coda's ears, you know, and all of a sudden she'll start telling me a story about Coda's ears and then she starts to smile and she starts to feel that love from Coda again. And I hope that it brings her a little bit of comfort to go back into that space where Coda is more present. Mm -hmm. I think the comfort, honey, I, for me, I think the comfort is the fact that you asked her about him. That's the comfort, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the honor I get is to tell you about him to tell you about Coda's ears, you know, and 19,000 other questions that you can ask me about, about Coda. 
the fact that you asked me, the fact that you let me share, the fact that you let me share my story. You know, I, I tell companions that all the time. I said, when, when you ask somebody, tell me about Coda's ears and she gets to tell you about Coda's ears that doesn't come with, well, can I tell you about my dog's ears? It doesn't come with that. Right. You can kind of set that aside because right now our world is so hungry for when we say, how are you? And they want to say, I want to tell you exactly how I am versus fine, because I don't want you to really know or fine, because I'm not sure what will happen if I really tell you how I am. And that scares me a lot. Mm -hmm. my, my husband laughs at me all the time. He's like, Queen, I think you've got something on your forehead that says, just tell me everything because I got it. I can handle it. And and I hear things that I'll never unhear. I hear things from people that other people are like, I've known them for years and I didn't know that. I'm like, yeah, it's right here. Just I have that me. tattoo too. You I got have, that one too? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm yeah. okay with it. I am so okay with it. I love hearing people's stories. Me too. Mm -hmm. Me too. I just think the wisdom of stories and, and to make space and to, to active listen, you know, our world doesn't active listen very well. Yeah. And, and so to active listen, we, here's what I tell when I do my classes, we listen to reply. We don't listen to understand completely. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and when we embrace, I call this an animal quotient an AQ, what we learn from animals to be better people. When we embrace being curious longer, like a dog does, if you look at them want, looking under a bush, man, they look hard, don't they? They keep going. Not like that leaves. Good. I got it. No, I want you to be curious longer. And I want you to say, tell me more. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about Coda's ears. Tell me more about Coda. Tell me about Coda. If Coda were to have a job, what do you think he would have done? Yeah. What do you think his job would have been? How do you think Coda's voice would have sounded? <laughs> One of the reasons I latched onto you so hard when I, I saw another interview with you was because of your intention around creating memories with your pet while they're still alive. And especially in those end days. Um, and as a professional pet photographer, that's what I do. I, I create, I help my clients create those memories, um, taking them on an experience, a journey, an adventure, um, and, and building a story for them to tell. Um, why is the memory and the storytelling so important to you? Angela, I have two answers for you on that one. Answer number one, and I told you this before you hit the record button, anybody can take a picture. We've all got iPhones now or whatever phone you have. Anybody can take a picture, but to capture a memory is a completely different act. It's a completely different act. And, and this is the second answer. And then I'll unpack both of them. I have a, a drawing of Miko that's sitting above me on the top of this shelf and it's a pencil drawing and it was done years and years and years ago. And I found this artist at a bakery and, and his work was just beautiful. And so I had him do this pencil drawing of Miko. What was interesting, I took, I, I stared at it. I didn't like it. The first one that he did, I didn't like it. And I couldn't figure out why. And finally it dawned on me why I didn't like it. His interpretation of her personality and her spirit was in her mouth. Mm. Whereas her, her personality and spirit were actually in her ears you know what I'm talking about? I do. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And when it finally dawned on me that that's why I didn't like it is because he had made it in her mouth versus her ears. And I took it back and I said, you have to redo her mouth. That is not where her personality is at, by the way, you've drawn this. And I think that the amazing work that you do and to understand where, where are your animal's personality? Where's their spirit? where, where do you, where do you feel the love from them coming from? And then tell me about the life that you all share together. And then you take all of those things and you don't take a picture. Mm -mm. You capture, you capture a memory, you capture love. That's completely different than taking, than the act of taking a picture, completely different, 
completely. And like I said, anybody can take a picture, yeah. but, to, but to capture what you capture and for our listeners out there to capture more than just a picture is really a powerful, powerful thing that will happen. Yeah. Um, a few weeks ago, I took Bella to the coast to have a couple of sessions with two of my dog photographer friends uh, because I can take epic pictures of Bella. Um, she, I have taught her how to pose. She knows hold your pose. She knows, you know, she knows to stand and, and she knows to not look at the camera because she can be a little bitch sometimes. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love it. But oh. what I couldn't do is get a great picture of the two of us together. And I will tell you, Colleen, I just, I've had my gallery showings now with both of my friends and I am throwing money at them in ways I never thought I would throw. I'm spending thousands of dollars to get wall art and photo albums done because the work they did in seeing the way Bella and I are together, mm -hmm. I can't do that myself. I can't. That's the value of what I do. And, yeah. and that's the value of what my friends, Mark and Holly do. And Angela, you know, what is so key about what you just said, what is so key. And I do this in all my marketing as well. Those, those pictures behind you of Bella are absolutely spectacular, but do you know when, do you know when things jump off the, off of the, off of the page, off of the canvas, off of the, whatever is when there's a human in there that models the human animal bond. Yes. And, and it's so tough with these precious babies. It's so tough to not have that just exude when you're sitting there with her, you know, and that, and I, and I tell my social girl all the time, I said, when you put a picture out, it's got to have a human in it mm -hmm. because that's the power of our relationship. That's the power of the bond is when you can see those things together. And, and I, and I'm going to back up just a tiny bit here too. You know, I think it's one of those things that as we get to the end of a life with our pets, we look back and say, did I take enough? Did I take enough? Did I capture enough? And, and I think it's bigger than, did I take enough pictures? But the bigger question is, is did I capture enough of life and love and, and us in, in what we were together? Did I capture enough of that? And I go all the way into even the videos, you know, and capturing their walk, capturing how they bark. Yeah, they all bark different. Some raise their heads, some bark three times, whatever it may be, you know, is all of that captured for perpetuity. I have an urn that um, I, I wear a lot of times and this urn comes apart and in the urn is a USB port. Mm -hmm. And I've got my portraits of the babies. I've got their video, the, the audios of them barking. <sighs> so Mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. And so it's always close to me. And in the other half of the urn is the hair and fur and a whisker of all of my living and deceased babies. Mm -hmm. So they're always, they're always right here next to my heart, every part of their being and the love. Wow. What are some of the other ways we can hold close to the memories of our beloved pets other than, you know, photography and, and keeping bits of their fur and stuff. What are, what are the ways we can build our stories around our dogs or pets? You know, the boy, I tell you what, I could go off on two days with this one because you know, the, the options are going to, the options are going to mimic the things that everybody enjoys to do together. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. <clears throat> I worked with a lady years ago and she was a great Pyrenees mama <sighs> and she, and pumpkin pumpkin was her heart. Okay. Pumpkin was her heart. Do you know what she did with that great Pyrenees from the minute pumpkin came into her home till the minute pumpkin died mm -hmm. is she brushed that dog and sent that, that fur off and had it woven into yarn. And at the very end of pumpkin's life, she was just about an inch shy of a king size blanket for her bed. <sighs> so when pumpkin died, I shaved pumpkin, which I know the, the spinners don't like that was shaved, but, but it was our last, it was what we had. Mm -hmm. And so I shaved and she finished out her, her blanket. So my, my story there is that whether it's creating a diamond 
I have a, a friend who has a, a company called Let Your Love Grow, where we can mix ashes with a product that makes it very good for our ground. Ash, to scatter ashes is bad for the ground, mm -hmm. but it takes and makes it very good. So for our gardeners, a beautiful way to say this was this was Harry's garden. I, I've got a rock out there by my garden pond where I swear to you, every time after grooming, after grooming, only after grooming, he'd go stand in a dirty garden pond. So there is now a rock out there that has his actual paw print on it. And it says Harry's pond. And so we named that. Out. So the, the amount of relationships and, and how we, how we, how we mix with our pets and what we do and, and the personalities and the things that create memories like him standing in my garden pond, those are all the various ways that we can capture those memories and that we can do things to honor those memories some people make diamonds out of ashes. Some people, again, scatter the ashes. Tons of things that you can do. People sometimes get all worked up. I know you're looking there and there's a portrait right there. Yes. Of one of my little pups, okay? A Yorkie. You know? Yeah, yeah. he's actually a Yorkie Chihuahua. That is an actual portrait on a canvas that was sent to me by a friend when uh, when Crisco died. Okay, Aww. let me tell you the story. It, it's, it's a canvas. It's a wrapped canvas, yeah. Angela. When that showed up and I unwrapped it, my husband gasped and he said, Colleen, all of those colors on that piece are exactly what I saw in Crisco's urn. So do you know what we did? We cut the back away from that canvas print and his ashes are in the back. Oh, that's beautiful. So whether it's cutting a tennis ball and putting the ashes in there, my brother, my I'm from Western Kansas. My brother is a hunter. He has German short hair uh, pointers. And after, after his dogs die or when his dogs die, he will wrap up hunting season, pheasant hunting season, as he's loaded their ashes into shotgun shells. And the final shot of the season is of those ashes across the favorite field of that dog. Wow. So you see how we could talk for days? Yeah. Days? So it's really for people to kind of back up we have, I can't tell you how many people I've told them when they share with me what a treat hound their dog is. I'm like, then use this treat jar. That's the perfect urn for your dog. It really is. Use the treat jar. Yeah. Yeah. So there are so many ways that you can take what they love and craft that into be their permanent memorial and, and to, you know, put those up and to, to show those. That little, the toy right next to his piece up there is a free heart guard snowman that came out when he was a puppy. And I'm not even going to tell you what year, because he was almost 17 when he died. And uh, he carried those everywhere. I had to do an all call after he tore up a couple of them. I put an all call out. I'm like, heart guard snowmans. I need heart guard snowmans. And so one went to cremation and that one will forever sit by his urn. That's amazing. Really, what we're talking about here is experiencing your pet and learning to live more in the moment in the way that they do, aren't we? Absolutely. Yeah. And and think about the power of that. You know, I always talk about the gift that our animals give us is presence. Mm -hmm. And it's always presence. And that's why I love when those guys are sitting right behind me. They're sitting right behind me. They are my strength. There's a, a days I wear an urn that has all the hair and fur. I've got another um, pendant that I wear that is Miko's paw print. And so every day that I get up, I just, I kind of feel where I'm at that day and what I need, what kind of strength I need. And uh, sometimes it's a, a legacy strength from Miko. And sometimes I'm like, I just need y'all behind me right now. Just need y'all behind me. So I'll wear one of those. Um, but it, but it's living in the moment. It's honoring, it's honoring the gift of presence and honoring the gifts that they give us in that way. And animals are so fabulous about teaching us how to just be, just be in the moment. Yeah. And when I need to find my center, I take Bella and I go for a hike and I talk to Shep and I ask him for some guidance on where I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to do, because I believe that he, he put me on the path to where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And so I trust in him mm -hmm. to, to tell me where I'm supposed to go. Yeah. And you know what, let's talk about that one second, because I get, 
I get a lot of people that um, feel guilty when they get a, when they get a Bella, you know, following a chef. And, you know, first of all, I tell them we are not going to use the word replacement. Mm -mm. Okay. This is another personality. And that's, that's, man, that is too big of a, of a request to ask them to replace. I said, let's not do that. And I said, and when the time is right, and I don't, I don't say go do this right now. I, I say, when the time is right, then if you're ready, bring another baby into your home. Okay. When the time is right. Now, here's what I, I want you to remember animals. If there's another animal in the house or when we bring this one in, they make the best therapists there are. Oh. And so you can cut, sit over there and cuddle up on that couch and set Bella up next to you and say, I got to talk about Shep today. Mm-hmm. It's a remembering Shep day. And you know what? They sit right there and listen. They, they don't tell me that. Mom, God, we have heard this story. Are we seriously going to talk about this one again? We've been around this barn. We've been around this barn countless times. Oh, you know what? They sit right there and they look at you and they say, in their eyes, tell me more, mm-hmm. Mama. Tell me about Shep. Mm-hmm. And they're the best therapist there is. I knew she wasn't replacing him. I knew he opened my heart up for her. Oh, love that. Mm-hmm. Love that. Because my heart was very closed before I met him. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't trust. I didn't even know the meaning of the word love until I met him. And now um, you know, there's no question. I loved him. Yeah. I love him. I still love him. That love is yeah. never going to die. No, no. But, and I don't feel bad in saying this. I love her more than I could have ever loved him because he allowed me the space to learn how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And isn't that the cool thing about animals? They're oh. okay. To, it's okay to tell them you have a favorite. They don't care. <laughs> <laughs> they don't care. It's just going to be over it pretty quickly. <laughs> totally. Versus skin children. You're like, mom, seriously, I'm not your favorite. Like, no, the middle one. I loved him most. <laughs> oh God. I love it. You have a um, resources on the two hearts pet loss center website. Uh, one of them is uh, the template for a bucket list. How important is it that we do bucket list items with our pets when we know their time is coming? You know, I think the importance comes if that's important to you. Mm. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the six month rule. Okay. So I want you to put yourself out six months from now, look back on today. And are there things that, that you think should be checked off and you think things that you could do that could create those final memories. Okay. Mm. Then if that's the case, do the bucket list, do the bucket list. And, and sometimes here's what else I tell people. Let's just say you called this morning and you set the appointment and this afternoon is going to be the time. Okay. And then all of a sudden you go, Oh my gosh, I didn't, I didn't even know about a bucket list. I didn't even know about a bucket. We didn't do a bucket list. I say, yes, yes, you can. You, you still have time to, to take that walk in the park. Mm -hmm. You still have time to, to do something that as you stop for a minute, as you stop for a minute and to say, what can I do over the next few hours that can give me those final memories? I'll give you another story. Sometimes it's not about the walk, but it's about the experience of the event. Okay. And here's what I mean by that. I had a group I was working with in Canada And, um, they were, one of our vets was going to be going out that evening to assist a family with their kitty cat. And I had asked the, the, the young lady who had set the appointment, I said, did the mommy of the kitty cat say anything, you know, interesting to you about the kitty cat? She said, yeah, she said, she made mention that the kitty cat loved her husband's socks. And I said, so what I might recommend when we get to the house tonight is that we say, might I recommend we put this kitty cat to peace in your husband's sock drawer? And they did. And imagine Angela now, as they think about, as they think about that final act of love, they're looking down and that little pussy cat is laying in his heaven on earth in the sock drawer. Something you will never unsee. Yeah. And that when you think about kitty cat, and the end of the pussycat's life, the, the thing that you think about is 
the look on his little face laying in that sock drawer. So those are the things that I talk to families about too is when the day comes, when the time comes, I want you to even be empowered to say, I want the end to happen here because he loved that. I can't tell you how many families I've gone to assist in the, in the, in the a dog, always a dog, was in the, <laughs> oh, sh I love you. There we go. And the dog was in the back, the back seat of the car because that's where he loved to be. And so the veterinarian put him to sleep in the back seat of the car. Wow. The empowerment, the empowerment to say, this is what I want the end to look like. Because it will happen. How do you want it to look? Um, is it a privilege to... You know, there are a lot of people out there who think, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I want to be in the room. I don't, I don't want it. I don't want to be there when I, when my dog dies. Um, it, and again, you know, we, we talk about the individual experience and, and I think it's okay to not be there if you can't be there, but at the same time, is it not really, or is it really more a privilege in you know the act the ultimate act of compassion and love to say goodbye to your pet when your pet needs to say goodbye did I jumble that up too much no I think I got you I think I got you um you know I I think people want them to know what they can handle okay mm -hmm. I want them to know what they can handle however Let's go back to the six month rule again. Do you believe that you're going to look back on this day six months from now and feel guilty because you weren't there to say goodbye? And I, I'm not saying that to, to make that be a, uh, um, a judgmental question or one to shame you. All I want you to do is answer the question. If you believe, I know I had to do this with my father when my brothers called and said, we're there, are you coming home? And I had to stop and think and, and put myself out years from then and say, how will I feel with the decision I just made? Mm. And, and I needed to be comfortable with that. And I've still been comfortable all these years later. I'm comfortable with it. But I stopped and I thought about it. And I was mindful and I was intentional with the decision that I made. And that's what I want pet, pet parents to do is I want them to be very mindful of the decision that they're making to be there, or to not be there. And, and no judgment, no judgment. Okay. I know how I feel, but, but, you know, we live in this society right now that if you feel different than I feel, then you're wrong. And I don't believe that. It's, I don't so, believe true. That. it's so true. It's so true. What I want you to do though, because six months from now, I don't want to be holding you in my arms because you say, I feel so guilty. I wasn't there. I need you to think about it. I want you to stop and I want you to remove the emotion for a minute. And I want you to think about it. How will you feel six months from now with the decision you made to be there or not be there? Doesn't matter to me. Make sure that's, you're comfortable with that, whatever. That, that's that's going to be a really tough conversation to have when somebody is in a very emotional state because it's they're not, their pet. it's not, it's not at all. It's to say, I need you to stand tall for one second. I need you to stand tall. You have a decision to make when in grief, we have a huge need to be understood, but very little capacity to understand. Mm. I need you to, I need to move the blood from the back of the head to the front of the head. And I need you to help me make a decision right now. Okay. I need you to think for a minute. How will you feel six months from now mm -hmm. about your decision? So that is, it, is that um, a way of easing the guilt that can often come, you know, the, the, um, Dr. Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief and how powerful the guilt stage can become, especially for pet parents, because we often think if I could have just gotten him to the vet sooner, if I could have, or maybe I should have, it's a very powerful state of being and and it's very easy to get stuck in that state too i know i was in it for years mm -hmm. with shep and it's it's only really since i started studying grief that i'm realizing i couldn't have 
I couldn't have changed what happened. And so the guilt is, is going away now, but that, you know, he died eight years ago. That's a long time to stay in that stage. Um, is, can the planning and the, and the thoughtfulness of, of going through the stages of, of pet loss grief with someone like you, can that alleviate some of that guilt? It alleviates some of it. You know, I, I think there's always an element of guilt, Angela, Mm. um, just because, you know, and, and maybe it's a guilt because I I feel bad. I traveled so much for my job and I wasn't here, you know, it, it might be that, and I missed days and I miss precious time and I missed all that. So I think there's always going to be an element of guilt, even through all the planning. Mm. Okay. And then with our pets, you know, just like anything, we can plan and plan and plan and then best laid plans. We end up in the emergency room and something has happened. Yeah. So I think it's, it's being kind of ourselves, kind to ourselves and saying, I did the best I could at that particular moment with the information I had and I made the best decision. And so that can help with part of it. I think some of the other aspects of it, and I know, from my perspective, when I start to get the coulda, shoulda, wouldas questions, I, I, in, in the search for meaning is a part of our journey. It's a part of our grief journey in the, in the asking of the questions. And when I ask questions to say, what could I have done different? Okay. What I, what I tell companions and what I tell grieving hearts is those answers have to be your answers. Not what Angela tells me when I say, what could I have done different? You know what Angela might say to me? She might say, Colleen, you need to, you did everything. You were a good mommy. You didn't miss a thing. That's not what I need to hear. Okay. That's not what I need to hear. In fact, what I need you to say to me is, what do you think you missed? What do you think you could have done different? Because just like where you got to Angela, which you finally got to the point that said, you know, I looked at it and I really did do everything. I really did. And to have somebody as a, as a good, healthy support companion, help you with those questions. Again, not my answers. These are not my answers. Okay. Just like when somebody says to me, do you think pets go to heaven? That is not my answer. That matters. It is your answer that matters because I want to believe whatever you believe. That's what I support. Okay. Not here to argue with you. And when we say things like, Angela, stop. You were a good mom. You did everything. You should never question yourself. Your tummy starts to turn into a knot and you're like, shut up, just Mm -hmm. shut up. Cause that's not how I feel. Right. Right? Yep. Versus saying, tell me what you believe you could have done different. Tell me what you believe you missed. Right. Tell me what signs you believe he was giving you. And, and you help somebody with the, with the answers to the questions, their answers to the questions that gets them to the point that says, you know what? I did do everything. I did. I did. I did do everything. And I think, I'm, let me tell you something else back to you and what you do. What I tell people a lot of times is they're in the end of life walk and you've had friends just like I've had friends where we look at these precious little loves that are in their life and we know it's time. Mm-hmm. But mommy and daddy aren't there yet. Mm-hmm. What I tell them a lot too is take pictures, take daily pictures. And this is phys- from the physical aspect only. Okay. This is mm-hmm. different than your beautiful photography. This is just to see a physical change that then can give me one more nugget. One, It's only a nugget. Give me a nugget to say. And I want to talk about, is it time or is it not time? I want to talk about that for one second. Sure. Because... A a part of the guilt conversation that I get, that I get nine times out of 10 was, I think I made the decision too soon or too late. Yes. And here's how I want to reframe that. When it's time, when the time is here, it is a window. It is a window. We are in a window of time because it's not a finite time. It's a window of time. And when we're in the window of time, any time in there is the right time. It's the right time. There's not a finite time that says it was the right time. I want to layer onto that. I was mindful enough with Crisco. 
I was mindful enough to know that he was going to die like he lived. Well, all of mine did, but Crisco was the most, Crisco was the most visible. He was going to die like he lived. And I told the veterinarian, my beautiful Dr. Kimmy Simpson, when she came over, I said, Kimmy, I said, he's a poop head. He's a poop head. (laughs) He's a big poop head. And I said, he is going to die like he lived. And he was a huge poop head, all eight pounds of him now, six pounds. He's a poop head. And so please know that this euthanasia is not going to be easy. Mm. And and she went, I got it. Mm. Girl, after needle number three, because he was fighting and being a poop head, Mm. he was ready. He was ready. And and she's white in the face now. And I said, Kimmy, I told you he was not going to make this easy on any of us. (laughs) This one is unbelievable, but I was mindful enough to know that's exactly what he was going to do. That's how he was going to go out. He went out exactly like he lived. Exactly. (laughs) He's a poop head. (laughs) What a beautiful way to remember that moment though. You know, because Crisco always had that personality. And he oh. did it right to the end. To the very end. And you yes. can hold on to that and go, he was a little shit. Just oh my right up God. until the last. Right up. <laughs> and I I got to tell you, I'm going to say this on this. I, I believe in a platter of resources for pet loss and grief. Okay. I believe in Reiki. I believe in, in alternative medications. I believe, I believe in memorialization. I believe in, in grief support. I believe in animal communicators. I have this, I believe in all of this. Do do I do all of them? No, I don't. Mm. But I have this platter of resources that says here, you pick what you need. Okay. Yeah. So we had, we did, we chatted with the communicator and, uh, and I said, uh, please confirm with me. He was ready. I said, I think he was just being a poop. And she howled. She goes, oh, all those little noises he was making. She goes, he was F-bombing. She goes, he was F-bombing on the way out. <laughs> I'm not, Angela, not surprised. Sounds like my kind of dog. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all, all feisty, six, seven, eight pounds of him. And so for our listeners, it, it is being mindful of, now my big Harry, my big Harry, he went gentle. Mm-hmm. And he waited till I got there on a, on a, on a middle of a trip over to Tampa to teach a pet loss class. I get the call, I get the text, he's collapsed and today's the day and Southwest airlines, God bless them. And I will forever be indebted. Got me back here to Dallas midair turnaround. Boop. Got me back here. What? And, uh, yeah. 15 minutes before he died. And he waited till I got there and then died gently as he lived, oh. as he lived. Wow. So as pet mommy, it's catching your breath a minute and saying, how will I see this? What will happen? I want to be eyes wide open into what will happen with them and what will happen with, with how we're going to do this. Mm-hmm. Eyes wide open. I'm going to, I'm going to craft that, but I'm also going to be ready for an audible that may come in from the, the side and life may have other plans. I may end up at a, at an emergency clinic, whatever. Eyes wide open. We we enter into relationships with pets, not necessarily knowing that there are things that are going to have to be done, but it really is inevitable, isn't it? You know, I I, I love to embrace the Garth Brooks song, The Dance. Mm. It's going to happen. And I'm glad I don't know how the end will happen. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm going to live in the moment. I'm going to embrace every day. I'm going to sit and I'm going to just be, and I'm going to know that one day it's going to happen, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to be in fear of it. I'm not, I want to, I want to show up on that day and know that I gave a hundred percent of love in my heart and they gave it back to me. That's all I want. My husband gives me grief sometimes because um, he's not so comfortable with the camera being around all the time. But for me, I need to have those pictures of her. I need to have those stories of her um, 
because I'm so much better a photographer now than I was when Shep was alive. And I look yeah. back at some of the pictures I took at Shep and I'm like, oh my God, those are garbage. Why are you holding on to them? Because they're my bubba. Yeah. I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to forget those moments, whether they're cell phones or my old Nikon D40, you know, and yeah. um, five camera bodies later, um, you know, and my Bella. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to lose a moment. I don't right. want to, I want to hold on to all of those stories. And yeah. um, it's, it's just the, the stories that I'm going to be able to tell of her after she is gone. Yeah. Mean everything to me. And they're going to bring, they're going to keep her alive for me. Yes. Just in the yeah. same way that Shep does, Yeah, you know, and, and I, I, I think that, you know, trying to normalize how we feel about pets in general, not just about pet loss grief is, is part of it too. You know, in my, in my photography business, I do say, I want you to feel empowered to tell people I love my dog that damn much, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. because yeah. it's okay. Oh, yeah. what could, what's wrong with love? What's wrong with giving your love to a four-legged hairy creature? Nothing, nothing better. Nothing Absolutely better. Nothing. Because yeah. they give it back in so many ways. Yes. Yes. Oh, I love it. I love <laughs> it. Yay. How fun has this been? Oh, gosh. It's been such a treat. Colleen, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, if there's one thing you want to leave our listeners with, what would it be? I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave two things. Okay, good. Two things. Be kind to yourself and honor that journey with those precious loves. And secondly, secondly, you don't get a do over. So you have got to capture the memories for, for absolute permanent forever. You don't get a do over. Always remember. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for letting me be with you. We really could talk for hours. (laughs) There's so much to dissect about living with our pets, losing them, and the grief we experience before and after they leave our physical world. Colleen is a, well, (laughs) she's pretty fantastic. If you pick up her book, it's full of stories of pet parents who have come to her for assistance on that last walk with their fur kids. You're certainly to come away with a few nuggets on how to handle that journey yourself in addition to all the nuggets she gave in this episode of One Last Network. I am so proud to be a graduate of her Pet Loss Grief Companion program and to call Colleen a friend. Next week, I sit with another friend, Carol Bryant, whom I met when she was the president of the Dog Writers Association of America. At the annual awards presentation in New York City in 2020, just weeks before the entire world shut down with COVID, I met her in person, along with her beloved boy, Dexter. More than a year later, Dexter died very suddenly, very traumatically. But Carol chose to share that journey and her grief publicly on her social media platforms. We talk about what that was like and how storytelling can be healing for the griever and helpful for pet parents who are unsuspecting of that most insidious disease, cancer. I'm Angela Schneider owner of Big White Dog Photography in Spokane, Washington, and your host at One Last Network, signing off to go get some Bella Snuggles. Listen to One Last Network on whichever podcast platform you prefer. We're on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Music, and Amazon Music. Don't forget to hit follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode. If you have a friend who might be interested in our content, make sure you share us with them. Thanks for listening.